Hi guys, welcome back. This is episode number 73 of Match Hat, featuring one of the greatest adventure games of all time, Sean Clark and Brian Moriarty's The Day. Of course I miss you, darling. This is the loneliest place on Earth. Most exciting thing ever happens here is a day when it don't rain. Uh, excuse me, darling, I got some work to do. Get on in here, Pete. We got us a big old asteroid on the three-week collision course with Earth. Sean Clark and Brian Moriarty's the dick. One of my favorite adventure games. I would place this in my top ten, if not my top five list of the greatest adventure games. The reason I like this, I just love the storyline. It's got some of the best, most memorable characters I've ever encountered in a game, period. And I really like the emotional response I get from this game. You really get attached to these characters and you want to see it through to the end. You, I get a little misty-eyed every time I play this through, even on repeated playthroughs. Now, this game has been underrated and criticized, even by fans of games like Monkey Island and The Fate of Atlantis, Maniac Mansion. And there's a couple of criticisms that I consider to be unfair. Uh, one is that the game is too short. I could, you could probably play this through in a single afternoon, maybe a couple if you are new to the genre. And some adventure gamers insist that a, a, tr a proper game should take weeks, if not months. But I question that, the logic of that, because usually what makes an adventure game take so damned long is stuff that's not any fun at all. Uh, puzzles where you get stuck and you have to try everything again and again, you have to do a lot of backtracking all over the place, you usually end up at a clue book or a walkthrough trying to get through it. Uh, not my idea of fun. I'd much rather have three hours of real fun <laughs> with a short adventure game than 50 plus hours of tedium and frustration. Um, other people have criticized it because this is a serious science fiction story. It's fairly conventional as science fiction goes. Uh, there's a little humor here, uh, not a lot of laugh out loud, not a lot of zany self-parody type stuff that you're familiar with if you've played the other Lucasfilm and LucasArts classics. Now anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful game that had a not so wonderful production cycle. It took a lot longer than anybody expected. Some people thought this was vaporware, it was taking so long. The company went through four different production heads trying to get the game <laughs> to get the game finally released and all kinds of changes, but it finally saw the light of day in 1995, and I'm very glad that it did. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is The Dig. Now the opening bits of this game remind me strongly of the Michael Bay film Armageddon, which was, of course, released three years after this. And the premise is similar. There's an asteroid on a collision course with Earth that will probably wipe out all of humanity. And the astronauts are sent up to lay down some nuclear charges. But the idea here is it's not to destroy the asteroid, but just to force it into a, a, a more stable orbit so that it won't crash. You've probably noticed by now the minimalistic interface here. If you remember from the Monkey Island game I reviewed, there were a lot of commands, at the, a lot of verbs at the bottom of the screen to click on. This, is, uh, this game is very even simpler than that. We just click the right mouse button to bring up the inventory, and then you click the items on where you want to use them. Now, this game was released only on CD-ROM, which was do a big anything. step for LucasArts. And they were competing directly now with uh, Myst from Cayenne, no. which I'll be reviewing way back. 
So they had a lot of competition. But the way they did this was to focus on the soundtrack instead of the graphics. So we have a full digitized soundtrack with lots and lots of really great voice work. Apparently my career is amusing to you, Commander. Why is it I can tease everybody on this crew except you? Because they know you like them, Commander. I like you, Robbins. No, you don't. Once you blast your way into the asteroid, of course, you discover that there's a lot more here than rock. Specifically, there's an alien technology the here. One. The story really is probably has more in common with something like Contact or Rendezvous with Rama than well, it does with it. Armageddon. Whatever it is we did. The story was inspired by well, Steven Spielberg and we'll fleshed out by up. Brian Moriarty and several other people, including Orson Scott Card. So quite a bit of talent behind this really epic story. Now some people will criticize the game because they feel it's too linear, too focused on the story. Uh, I personally like the story enough that that doesn't bother me. In a lot of ways this game reminds me of a really well done animated film. And I particularly like all of the drama among these three characters here. There'll be a lot of drama all throughout the game, a lot of conflicts, and that's what really keeps it interesting. Cut off. Should we go back outside and call them? Nah, they can sit tight for a few more minutes while we poke around. Where are you going, Lo? I was gonna check for water, or some way out of here. I think we should remain together. Fine. Follow me. This is no longer a space expedition, Lo. This is an archaeological dig. Therefore, I am the obvious leader. Fine. Whenever we need to dig something up, you can use the shovel. In the meantime, our first business is to survive. Our second task is to get home. We need to work together, and I'm still the commander of this mission. You don't know any more about surviving on an alien world than I do. Boston is right, Ludger. He's the one with experience in survival. And we need someone in command. This is no time for a foolish power struggle. All right, I agree. For now. Now here we have the characters discovering some the wreckage of an alien ship, and as it turns out, there are some different alien species that they'll be dealing with here. And the question is, is this a dead place, or are there still aliens left around? Uh, what is the purpose of this place? You know, all of the kinds of things you would expect from a really good science fiction yarn. And there is a lot of, a lot of the pleasure of the game does come more from listening to the conversations, to, to exploring the, uh, the world, than solving puzzles. There are some puzzles in this game, traditional uh, inventory stuff. Uh, the kind of things you would expect from any adventure game, but it's very underplayed here. And I think that a lot of people, again, don't like that at all. They find it too linear, too confining. I guess they're sort of like hyperactive monkeys and always have to be scratching or pushing or swinging on the bars. <laughs> you know, come on, folks. Sometimes you can just kick back and enjoy a really good story. And what a story this game has. It's all about immortality and wisdom. <laughs> what it means to be a human being. That was the longest visit from a ghost yet. The whole display centered on this basin. It's full of crystals. Are these the life crystals? Like the one you used to bring me back to life? They look like it. Then it couldn't be more clear. These life crystals are the reason they brought us to this world. They have found the secret of life, and they want to share. Weren't you watching, Brink? I don't care what language you speak, that ghost shaped itself like a skull. It was warning us, these crystals are dangerous. It was the symbol of death, Lo. These crystals are the antidote for death. That's what it meant. What if there are side effects? Did you think of that? The side effect is that I feel better than I ever felt before. If you had used a life crystal on yourself, your mind would also be as clear as mine. And you'd see that there is nothing more important than getting these crystals and using them. Brink, I think you're wrong. I think we need to be careful. 
These aliens are kind and good, Commander. They have given us a gift. Yeah? Well, if this is all so perfect, where are these aliens? Maybe they've moved on to a higher plane of existence. Or maybe they're all dead. <laughs> See how badly your brain is working. How could they be dead? They invented these life crystals. Commander, I feel sorry for you. Still tied down by an ordinary mind and ordinary fears. But I feel too good to want to argue with you. Believe what you want. I'm taking as many of these crystals as I can carry. Obviously, this question of, of the life crystals is the main crux of the game. Is it ethical to be immortal? What kind of consequences does that have for the civilization? Well, I'm going to take some for study back on Earth. I'm just not going to use them. But you will, Commander. Of course, there is plenty of action in the game as well. There's a grate down by Maggie. If you can lure the monster over toward it, then when Maggie unclogs the grate, the water I diverted will hit it like a fire hose. This is seriously your plan? Do you have a better one? Maggie, can you get the grate open? Has anybody thought of the fact that if it does spout water like a fire hose, I'm right here? That's a good point, Maggie. Hold on tight. How do I hold on tight when I'm unclogging a grate? That's why you get the big bucks. Do it, then. Just do it. It's only my life, anyway. You know what's amazing is even though you know she can't die, uh, this scene is still very dramatic and exciting. And quite a bit of fun, thanks to our friend Brink here. Come on, you ponderous exoskeleton. You cocoon-eating lobster face, cave-dwelling, arthropoidal elementary sphincter muscle! You're worried about your... I was joking, Boston. You know, like you strong, manly types do when you just about get killed. Maggie's safe now. I satisfied our little deal. So give me my crystals and let me get back to work. Brink, it's time for us to work together on... I said give them to me! Take one more step closer, Maggie, and you'll wish you were back with that giant lobster. That's what I love about this game, is the complexity of the plot, the drama between these characters. There's just a lot of meat here that you don't get in most games. He sure is weird. Now what? I've been getting the feeling that the ghosts want us to help them. As if they were stuck and wanted out. Stuck how? Well, the library console seem to indicate that they may have left this world for another. What if they want to come back, but can't? I don't know. How will we go about helping, assuming that's what they want, and they wouldn't eat us when they got back? Beats me. I'm just interpreting. I was reaching for a life crystal, and then the rock shifted. My circulation is cut off. No blood is getting to my hand. You can't pull me out, Commander. Don't leave me to die here, even if you have to cut off my hand. Now this scene reminds me of some of the interviews I read where Steven Spielberg, he had taken a lot of heat over Jurassic Park being too violent, too scary, even though it was rated PG-13. A lot of parents still took their very young kids to it. So the early, um, the early drafts of The Dig were, had been very gory and violent, so they took quite a bit of it out, but we were still left with this particularly uh, striking scene. I'll just let it play out for your enjoyment. I can't believe you endured so much pain without fainting. I'm fine, but I need more crystals. And that's all for this week's episode of Matt Chat. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then spread the word. Let your friends know about Matt Chat. Send them a link to your favorite episode. And help me build the audience a little bit. <laughs> you can also visit me at armchairarcade.com, where very soon we should have the next episode, the second episode of Armchair Arcade Radio available for you. Now you're going to enjoy that. And if you didn't like the episode, I might just have to send out the flim, carapace, slime-faced, mucus-brain, furry-legged abductor of luminously intelligent but pulchritudinous women. See you guys next week.